just to introduce myself, my name's Lawrence. I'm from a consultancy called Extropy. Uh, we, we do lots of online courses. If you're interested in any of that, then uh, come and talk to me afterwards. We have some laptop stickers here if you want to have some of those. An apology, first of all, the, uh, the amount of material I've got here is not going to fit into 40 minutes, uh, even if I go very quickly. So I'm going to jump around and miss bits out. So uh, what I thought I might do is if, uh, if people are interested to find out more about this, uh, contact me and I can set up an online session. We can go into more details about some of this. We can repeat bits if you want, because we have limited time. All right. So this is all about the maths that you need for, to understand zero knowledge proofs. And uh, this is called, people call this moon math, things like that, because it can be seen as a bit scary. It's really not that bad. It's just probably you haven't come across some of the concepts before or some of the terminology before. So what I'm going to try and do today is to just give you an introduction to that and explain what some of these things are. Uh, I'm sure it's just going to be the, the first step and you'll want to find out more. I mean, the whole area of zero knowledge proofs is super interesting. Uh, so, you know, please investigate further. Uh, hopefully this will be a good first step for you. All right. Uh, a quote here, uh, I, I tend to use quite a lot. And I think uh, Remco is here somewhere. Uh, it's, uh, this contains maths, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, if you don't understand it, it's not your fault. Please do ask questions. It's because I haven't explained it well enough. If you do know it perfectly, then, yeah, fantastic. Um, but, yeah, please do ask questions if you have them. All right, so let's make a start. So some of the hardest bits, I think, uh, or some of the things that put people off this area is the fact that they come across some new terminology. Uh, and it's difficult uh, if you're reading a paper. It's difficult if you have to get to grips with that, first of all. So some of the symbols you might come across. The most important one, I guess, is this, uh, this Z symbol which just means the set of integers. Zoom in. Yeah, sure. <laughs> OK, so uh, this set symbol, uh, the set of integers. Pretty much speaking, when we're, when we're doing zero knowledge proofs, when we're creating proofs, we're working with integers mainly. So we're working with the set of integers represented by that Z symbol. The other ones, we tend not to use so much, but I put them there for completeness. We also use things called fields, uh, so you get this symbol F here. Uh, and then what you will see a lot is this other symbol, well, the Z with the asterisk and the P. Uh, I'll explain what that means uh, later on. Okay. But don't be, don't be scared by that symbol if you come across it. It's really quite simple what it means. All right, modular arithmetic. I hope you kind of know what that is. If, you, um, if you've been a developer, you'll have come across the mod uh, operator. Uh, it just means we're more interested in the remainder of something rather than uh, an actual value. Sometimes it's called clock arithmetic because we do some operation and it kind of will wrap around. So if we're working with a, a finite set of numbers and we do some operations, it maybe will go past the end of that set and then wrap around and start again. And what we are interested in is the remainder uh, that we get at the end of that. All right. And so we write uh, something like this, n mod k, to simply mean the remainder. And as a convention, we, we take the remainder to be positive. All right, now that leads us nicely onto this idea of equivalence classes, because that means if we're doing, uh, if we're doing this mod operation, we're taking, looking at remainders, then often the remainder we'll get from a number of operations with a number of different operands will be the same. And so we can then put those things together and say, well, actually they're kind of equivalent. So here you've got an example if we're, if we, if our highest, if we're doing mod seven, um, then if we, if we do different, take different numbers, then they end up being five. Uh, if you, you know, take 12 mod seven, that's going to be five, etc. So in a way, this five, 12, 19, they're really equivalent because they're, they're equal to five when uh, we look at mod seven. So that's what equivalence classes are. All right. Uh, slightly more formal definition there. Let's skip over that. Uh, the interesting thing about this, though, if we're working in these type of fields where we, we're doing, we have a largest number and we're just interested in the remainder, is that if, if I told you that we've got an equation, we've got some x here, we mod that with 7 and the answer is 5, and I said, well, what's x going to be? You could say, well, OK, it's going to be 5. That is one answer. But there are other answers as well. It could be 12, 19, et cetera, et cetera. So this gives us, this is quite useful because this gives us a basis for a one-way function. So if uh, we're trying to solve equations like this, we could have multiple answers. And so trying to get that answer could be 
computationally difficult. You with me so far? Cool, all right. So, oh, yeah, the P. There you go. Whoops, make that slightly smaller. All right. Okay. Right, now, group theory. Now, this is not that difficult. Uh, it's, a, it's a concept, it's quite abstract. It's the kind of thing that you probably didn't learn in school because it is quite abstract, but it's really not that hard to, to get to grips with this. Um, but uh, what we have, when we talk about a group, we start off with some set of elements, and these could be anything, but typically they're going to be numbers. And in our, with for zero knowledge proofs, typically they're going to be a set of integers. Uh, and they will have an operation. We're doing something with these, uh, these elements in our, in our set. And uh, we could choose these whatever, to be whatever we want. So the mathematicians, the cryptographers could come up and say, okay, I'm gonna choose this set and I'm gonna have this operation. You can choose whatever you like. But if we're gonna call it a group, it has to have certain properties. And these are the properties. I'm not gonna go through all of these just for the sake of time. But the, the, the uh, in fact, the second one is slightly boring. The first one is interesting because we want, if we do an operation on these things in our set, we want the answer also to be in our set, because otherwise we wouldn't really know what to do with it. So that's a thing called closure. So whatever we do, whichever elements we choose, when we do an operation, the answer has to be in our original, it has to be in our set. Okay. Uh, I'll skip the associativity, it's just about ordering, not so interesting. Uh, we also want an identity element. So uh, the idea uh, behind this is that if we take any element, we do the operation with this identity element, then the answer we get is going to be the original element. It effectively does nothing. So if, for example, you're taking a set of numbers and our operation is addition, then an identity element could be zero, because if we add zero to any element, we get that element again. So that's an example of an identity element. And we need that if we're going to have a group. And then we also have the idea of an inverse element. So this is really uh, the idea that uh, each, you know, each element within our set is going to have some inverse. So it's a bit like if you, again, with the, the idea of addition, maybe have some positive number, and then this inverse would be the negative number of the same value. And the idea behind that is that uh, that's going to bring you back uh, to the identity element if you do the operation with this inverse. All fairly straightforward, I think. But that's just the rules. If you want to call it a group, it has to follow those rules. All right. It may be that you choose your set, and in fact, that's, uh, that is a group, but also there may be a smaller number of elements within your original set that is also a group. So that's called a subgroup, uh, just to let you know what that means. All right. Generators, okay, so uh, if we want to work through the elements of a group, um, it, uh, it may be easier to do something, to have something called a generator. All right, and this is a way that we can do an op use our operation uh, and start at a point and then use that operation to get to every other element within the set. Okay, so this is called a, a generator. Uh, and you could have, if you took all of the elements in your set, that would be a generator, it's a kind of trivial thing, that would be a generator set because you've already got there, really. Uh, but uh, we often want to get a smaller subset and, and have generators uh, there. So the, the easiest way to explain this is uh, give an example. So um, if you have, uh, for example, the integers, so that's the Z symbol, I've written that wrong, I'm sorry, uh, and then our operation is going to be addition, then the number one will be a generator for this because uh, we can get to every element within our set, so we can get to any integer by just repeatedly adding one to the, the value we've already got. It's a tedious process, but eventually we'll get there. Okay. Uh, and you can, uh, yeah, and you can, uh, got other examples there, but that's the idea of a generator. It's, an, it's a way that we can start an element, do an operation multiple times, and eventually that'll give us everything within our group. All right. Now, to move on from uh, groups, uh, we can sort of take that a little bit further and have things called fields. And uh, in this case, we have two operations, and we're going to call these 
addition and multiplication. Straightforward. Okay. Um, so, uh, one example could be um, the real numbers. And we have our two operations, and a, mul a multiplication. And then we see, you know, are these going to, uh, are these going to give us these, uh, these extra uh, properties that I want fields to have? So, we, again, we have the idea of uh, the closure. We want uh, anything that we do we get as a result of these operations to be in our set. So, for something like an addition and multiplication, that's going to be true for, say, the real numbers or for integers. We also have the, some properties. We want to be able to sort of change the order, do things in a different order. That's not that interesting. Um, we also want identity elements. So the identity element for addition is going to be 0. For multiplication is going to be 1. That's uh, OK, I think. Uh, also, we have the idea of inverses. Uh, now, for addition, Again, this is straightforward. We just take the negative number uh, of the value. That's going to be the inverse of the value. Multiplication, this is where it gets a little bit more tricky. Because uh, the way I always thought about multiplication was like the opposite of that is division. So if you want to find out kind of the opposite number for multiplication, you'd sort of work, you see what you get to divide. But the problem with division, if we have a set, say, of integers, we can't have the operation uh, of division in there because if I divide two integers, it may be that I'll get another integer, but I may not. I may get a, a fractional value. So we wouldn't get closure there. So that means that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't have closure, that wouldn't be a field, that wouldn't be a group. So how do we think about multiplication then and the, in, and the inverse? We just say that, uh, it kind of cheats slightly, we just say that there's going to be some element in there that uh, if we, uh, multiply it by its inverse, then we're going to get back to the identity element. We don't really say how we do that, but we just say that's got to be there. And luckily, for the, the things we use in zero knowledge proofs, we, we decide we're going to take sets where that is going to be true. And that, uh, let me just quickly go back to the, that terminology. This symbol here, this, this asterisk and the P, that asterisk means that this uh, this group or this field will have multiplicative inverses. So we will be able to do, we will be able to find something that is the opposite of the multiplication. Okay. I'm not telling you how we get there, but that's just, we, we decided that's going to be the case. All right. Okay. Where have I got to? So, uh, finite fields. So, uh, when we're working with zero knowledge proofs, particularly, uh, we often, uh, or pretty much always, work in finite fields. The set we take is going to be, have a, a, a finite size. It's going to have a maximum number. And that is often, we often get that by doing modulo p, where p is some prime number. It's going to be a big number, but that's usually what we uh, do. Uh, some other terminology you'll come across is the order of the field. That just means the number of elements within our field. Again, we have this idea of a generator. We want to, to be able to generate all the elements within our field. So if I call this G, um, for example, if my, my operation is multiplication, then I could say, well, if, I have a, if there is a generator G in my set, then if I take powers of G, G to the 0, G to the 1, G to the 2, then if it's a generator, that's going to give me all of the elements within my field. OK. And if you want to try this out, you, there's some examples here. So there's some very small sets, uh, but they do work as fields, and you can work out what the generators are. And this, in fact, as you see here, there's two generators. Uh, the, uh, the cyclic thing is just the, uh, the fact this is going to, yeah, this is going to generate every, every number within our field. All right. Is that okay so far? I feel I'm going really fast. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, perhaps if I stand here, this might help. Okay, all right, so um, now another thing, uh, a term you may not have come across uh, is this thing, group homomorphisms. Uh, again, it's, it's abstract, but it does, it is used in zero knowledge proofs, so I'll, I'll explain what it is. So imagine that we have two groups, okay? We've set up these groups, we've left this to a mathematician or a cryptographer, they've set up a group for us, uh, but they set up two of these. And uh, what we, we want to do is to, have some relationship between these two groups. Uh, they, ha they, ha okay. they have to be fairly, they have to be similar, uh, but we won't go into what that exactly means. Um, but we, we can set up 
Or if, they've, if these groups are set up in the right way, we can get a, a homomorphism between them, which means there's, there's a mapping. We can start with some element in group A and do this mapping. That'll give us a different element in group B. Okay. And if, uh, if this supports a homomorphism, then uh, what's that? this gives us a very useful property. And this is used uh, in zero-knowledge proofs. We do rely on this. The fact that if we have uh, an operation in our original group, and I'm representing that by the asterisk here, and we have an operation in our other group, which is the dot here, then if, if we have this homomorphism, if that's applicable to these groups, then we have this property that we can take some elements, x and y, in our, in our groups, and if we do the x uh, and the operation, x and y, they do that operation together, and then map that, that's the same as doing the mapping first on x, doing the operation in the second group, and the mapping on y. Okay, so it's just a lovely property that comes in really useful if you set up your groups correctly. All right. Complexity theory, I'm not gonna go, I'm just gonna mention a little bit about this. Uh, so uh, computer scientists have been interested in looking at problems uh, and how long they uh, they take to solve, how complex they are, and they, they decided to get all the problems and try to classify them into, into different classes. And they, um, they uh, decide to do this, they do it in a certain way. They, they uh, put these as what are called decision problems. So you, you phrase your problem in a certain way. And a, uh, a typical example uh, of this is the thing, the tra traveling salesman problem. So this is a an idea of, can you find a route between cities? If someone had to work out a route between cities, uh, can you work out a, uh, an optimal route between that? And you could phrase that as a decision problem by saying, is this particular route optimal for this particular set of cities? And what uh, complexity theory, what we're interested in is how, uh, how difficult is it to verify that one of the solutions we've got to our problem is correct? So if I, if I said to you, okay, uh, this salesman's got to travel between 20 cities, uh, and you say, okay, I've got a solution for that, I know the optimal way to do that, how quickly can I actually verify your solution and work out whether it's true or not? Okay, and so that is the, the, how we phrase the, the, the problem, and then depending on how quickly we can do that, uh, that gives us different classes uh, of these problems, and these are, uh, these classes here. So we have them called uh, NP, or P, NP, NP complete, NP hard. I'll just talk about P and NP. So P problems are problems that are seen as relatively easy. And what this means is that if, if uh, you give me a solution, then I can verify that solution in what is called polynomial time, which means that if uh, the way we phrase the problem is we, we have a number of inputs to our problem. So in the case of the traveling salesman, that will be the number of cities. So that's, uh, I'm gonna call that N, that's our uh, size of input. What I want to do is to say, okay, how long does it take me to verify the solution for this compared to the size of the inputs to the problem? So if, if N is five, if I take five cities, it may take me a certain time to solve. If N is 10, it may, it's gonna take me longer, et cetera. So what's the relationship between the time taken to verify the solution and the, the size of the input? Now, if this is polynomial time, what it means is that the, the relationship uh, between the, the input, the size of the inputs, and the, the time taken to verify the output is some polynomial. So it'll be n to some number. So you're going to be n squared, n cubed, something like that. It's that kind of value that you're going to get back. And that, as long as you know, n is reasonably small, that is seen as quite tractable. That is seen as quite achievable. Okay. The, uh, the next set, uh, NP, um, is, uh, is similar, but we don't, uh, sorry, that, with NP, yeah, we, we're, we're solving it, and we say the, the time taken to verify is going to be polynomial. Now, th there's a big question. Um, sorry, the, the P class is solvable in polynomial time verifiable in polynomial time. For NP, we're just talking about the being verifiable in polynomial time. There's a big question, are these two classes the same? It's an open question. If you know the answer, you'll get uh, a major prize and you'll be a famous mathematician because nobody knows. It's probably, it's probably very different at the moment, but nobody knows. Okay, but NP class, this is where we, we have some problem. Uh, it's probably gonna be quite difficult to solve, 
But once we've solved it, we can verify it in polynomial time. Okay. So uh, I think an easy way to think about this is this example here. So if I, uh, if I have a key, uh, to uh, some cryptographic key, um, and I want to uh, prove to you that's the correct key for uh, some encoding uh, that's happened, um, if you try to, to crack that encoding, uh, track that encryption, first of all, that's going to be difficult to do. So that's going to be that kind of the NP part of the, the problem. You're not going to be able to do that very quickly. But if I come to you with a solution and say, well, here's the key, you can verify that very quickly because you can just use that key to decrypt the whatever it was. Uh, and you'll do that yeah, quickly. That's in polynomial time. So that's the type of thing we do. And the reason, well, a couple of reasons why this is useful for zero knowledge is uh, that, uh, well, one is that the, the problems in NP have zero knowledge proof, uh, uh, well, have zero knowledge proofs, um, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, and then the, the other thing is that this idea of doing some computation and then being able to verify it very quickly, that's really at the heart of one aspect of zero knowledge proofs. That's the, sort of the succinctness of verifiable computation. Uh, it's not the zero knowledge part of zero knowledge proofs, but it's the idea you can have some computation, and then given the result of that, you can verify that that result is correct in a fraction of the time it would take you to do the computation. So you can see, hopefully you can see, that that's kind of tying in with this idea of the, the complexity classes. And then the, the other reason um, that we, we look at complexity classes, I won't go through the other ones, but I always want to introduce this notation, uh, which is this, this big O notation, is because this is how we talk about the, the times to, to verify a solution. So in, with the complexity classes, uh, if we say that the, the time to verify is dependent upon the input size n squared, we would say, and then big O means in the worst case, then we would say big O n squared. And when we compare, compare zero knowledge proof systems, we use this terminology to say, well, this proving time is better than that one because this proving time, you know, is depend, uh, depending on the size of the input uh, is, is, is uh, n squared, whereas this one is, you know, n cubed or something like that. So that's, we use this big, N, big O notation to talk about uh, the, uh, the com or the, the difficulty of uh, doing our, our proofs and verifying our proofs. All right. Again, I've been rushing through this. Is that okay? <laughs> so far. Okay. I'm not hearing anything, so I'll, I'll have to go on. All right. Now, uh, I've got no idea of the time. Oh, okay, I'm really running out of time. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, I'll skip, <laughs> skip elliptic curves. So elliptic curves, uh, so yeah, these are widely used. The, there are sets of points, uh, and we get the set of points by doing some equation. They often look like. Uh, this, uh, and what we find, if, if we've picked our values properly when we create our elliptic curve, uh, what we find is that the points on that elliptic curve actually form a group uh, in themselves. And the, the way you pick your elliptic curve, that's up to the mathematicians and the cryptographers, they will find these elliptic curves uh, and tweak them to do whatever they want. But what you need to think is that the points on this curve form a group. So if we take two points and do some operation with these points, the answer is also going to be a point on the curve. Okay? It's not going to be a general point, it's going to be a point on the curve. And these are very useful. Uh, and they form the basis of a lot of the cryptography we use and certainly uh, stuff that we use in zero knowledge. So the usual group operations also apply to elliptic curve points. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of that. Let's skip that. We haven't much time. Elliptic curves, they're usually visualized like this. Uh, and you see, so this is a trunk represent. We've done an operation between P and Q. And the way the operation works, it ends up with our, this is uh, how we sort of generate a, or derive a, a public key from a, a private key. Actually, this visualization, this would, the, this sort of the whole field we're looking at here, or the whole domain is the real numbers. Actually, usually we're looking at integers. So if you plotted this elliptic curve where you're just looking at integers, you end up with something like this, which is not as pretty and not as intuitive. So you, you tend not to do that. All right. Uh, where am I getting on? OK, I'm going to skip pairing, I'm afraid, uh, so I can keep going. Polynomials. Uh, the heart of all zero knowledge proof computation, where we build proving systems, etc., seems to be polynomials. I don't know. Well. 
I kind of know why, in that they have very useful properties. Uh, they, they, there's lots of techniques we can do with them, uh, we can do with polynomials that are really useful. Um, and fortunately, polynomials are quite straightforward. And I'm sure in your math classes at schools, you'll have been given polynomials and asked us to, to solve them and asked to find the roots of polynomials, etc. But uh, a lot of what we do with zero-knowledge proofs involves polynomials, and it's because they have great, uh, great properties, great features. We can do some interesting things. Let me go to the heart of uh, one of them. Uh, so, uh, when I say, uh, if I talk about the root of a polynomial, this means when I evaluate that polynomial, so a polynomial can be represented like this. So if I have that and I put in some value of x, that will uh, give me an evaluation. Here, a, these a values are, are constants. So uh, I, I put in some value of x, and if the, that evaluates to zero, then we say that x, uh, that particular x, is the root of the polynomial. So the root means why the polynomial evaluates to zero. And it can have multiple roots. There can be multiple values of x for which that will be true. OK. Um, we, uh, we, I, this is a univariate, so we've just got x as a variable. You can have, you could have y's in there and z's, and you can have multiple multivariate polynomials. But for this, we'll just uh, have x. So um, if we have a uh, root, so my polynomial is called p. I evaluate that on a point x, uh, then, or I, that, that it sort of varies according to x. If I evaluate it at a particular point a, and that comes out as zero, then a is a root of my polynomial. Okay. So if that's true, then I can. Uh, there's a little technique that is used everywhere in zero knowledge proving systems, where we uh, we can kind of decompose our polynomial. So if I know a root a then I can get my original polynomial, and I can rewrite it as x minus a times some other polynomial called q. All right. And I know this is going to work, because at point a, if I put that as x, then this first term is going to evaluate to 0. Uh, and so p of x is, you know, we said it's going to be 0, so that, that works. So this thing is going to hold true generally, not just for this point uh, a, but you know, any, ver any value of x that I plug in this, this is going to be true. But it's a way we can decompose our, polynomial, our original polynomial into a slightly smaller polynomial, because q of x is going to have fewer terms than our original p of x. Okay. And we use this technique in zero-knowledge proofs because at the heart of what we do with zero-knowledge proofs is we often we, we kind of transform things into polynomials. Then we start to say, are these polynomials, uh, are they equivalent to each other? And we try to evaluate polynomials, things like that. And these polynomials are huge. So they have like a million, 10 million terms, something like that. But what's a nice technique is if we can sort of uh, break them down into small things, uh, smaller and smaller steps. And also, if we can set up things where we can create a polynomial with this sort of relationship. So we can say, uh, we can sort of say, we can create relationships between polynomials. OK. All right. Um, the other, oh, okay, script split over two slides, sorry. So this also is the heart of uh, zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, so what, uh, what we're trying to do uh, when we're, uh, we have a prover and a verifier with zero-knowledge proofs. The prover is going to submit a proof to a verifier, and the verifier is going to be skeptical about that proof and going to try to see if the prover is cheating, okay. And what that often boils down to is that the, uh, the way that this is presented is that the, the prover is going to be sending some uh, form of polynomial or some commitment to a polynomial or, or some evalu evaluation of a polynomial uh, to the verifier. And the verifier is going to be saying, well, OK, you claim that that's, that's your proof. All right. Well, if that's going to be true, Tell me what this evaluates to at, and then the verifier will come up with a random point. Okay, and the the choice of points the verifier has is huge. We work in very big fields, uh, like two to the two hundred and fifty, something like that. So the verifier will pick one of those values at random and say, okay, if your proof is true, then evaluate your polynomial at this random point. What what does it equal? And then the uh, the prover has to come back with a value for that, and then they the Verifier will you know, choose some other points and ask for that. 
And what they're really saying is the, uh, if uh, the, the prover is kind of has some, uh, has got this claim about the polynomial, and so the verifier knows without knowing the entire details of the polynomial, they kind of know how that polynomial should behave. And what, what this, uh, the schwarz zippel lemma helps us with is to say that if the prover tried to cheat and just came up with some random polynomial as their proof, they just, just, chose, something that, just chose something at random, then that wouldn't match the, the kind of the correct polynomial that was a correct proof. Because uh, when the verifier is checking this, Whatever points they choose, that random polynomial that the prover's got, the cheating prover has come up with, is probably going to be different to a correct polynomial, because it's going to be different at most points within, our, within the system we've chosen. So this means, this is great for us when we're building our system, because it means we can, just by checking a few points, we can see whether the prover is cheating, because if they come up with some random polynomial, then it's likely that that's not going to be evaluated to the same value as the correct polynomial at, the, at this random point that the prover chooses, sorry, that the verifier chooses. So that is a great thing about polynomials. That's why we, we use polynomials. Okay. All right. Uh, how am I doing for, I've probably only got a few minutes left. Um, yeah, I won't. Uh, the other thing, okay, I'll just talk about this very briefly then. So. We, we have this idea of provers and verifiers. So the, the prover is, has got their proof. They've turned it into something like a, a polynomial. Or they, they, they've built their proof into a polynomial by some means. Uh, now, if they just sent that to the verifier, that would be problematic. One is that it's, it's huge. It's a huge amount of data. And if the verifier had to evaluate this polynomial as it was, that would, be, that would take quite a lot of time. Also, it would mean that the prover is sending all the information to the verifier. Now, with a zero-knowledge proof, the prover doesn't want the verifier to know everything. The, the prover has some secret. So they want their proof. They, want, they don't want the verifier to get all the information. Uh, so they want to make sure that the verifier can't work out their secret. So the way that we get around that, instead of just sending a polynomial to our verifier, we have these things, polynomial commitment schemes. And what, this, what these allow us to do is the prover will say, OK, this is my proof. Uh, and I'm committing to it. So that means they can't change their mind later. So that helps to stop them cheating. But also it, it means that they're committing to the, to the proof, to the polynomial, so the, the kind of the format of the polynomial which represents their proof. It also means that the, this commitment is committing to the evaluations of this uh, polynomial as well. So what the verifier can do is to go and get, from this polynomial commitment scheme, they can go and get uh, evaluation. So they could say, okay, evaluate your polynomial at point 123 without knowing the actual polynomial that is being evaluated. They'll get back, or they can get back an answer, and they can check that this is what the prover has committed to. So this is all designed to keep the, the prover honest and to make sure that the verifier can stop the prover from cheating. So these schemes, I mean, these sound kind of too good to be true, and they are quite complex things. There are different types of schemes that are being used, and they kind of lead to the, uh, the different types of proving systems. So uh, there's a commitment scheme called FRI. That's the scheme that is typically used with Starks. So that, that whole group of uh, zero-knowledge proof systems. Uh, KCG, that's a uh, type that is used with SNARKs. It's a different type of proving system. Uh, other ones, the, uh, the IPA, that's used with bulletproofs. So, yeah, different types of uh, commitment schemes uh, lead to different proving systems. There's a kind of a diagram here. They have different properties. Um, so I'll just uh, show this. This is showing some of the properties of these schemes. So the, uh, the hash function, this is what the FRI commitment scheme users and this it has all sorts of wonderful properties things like being post quantum uh, if we have quantum computing this scheme will still work uh, other types uh, aren't so good um, I'll, I'll, this is where we get the, uh, the comparison where with our big O notation so you can if you work this out you can see here that you know these ones pairing groups that are uh, from KZG uh, they're very efficient so O of one means 
we don't actually care how big the input is. This is a constant size we're going to get back in terms of the complexity. So you can have a look at all these diagrams and see sort of the trade-offs that we get between all of these different zero-knowledge proof systems. Okay. Um, I think I'm uh, running out of time, so I'll just skip right to the end. <laughs> Um, so sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so just to give you a link to some resources, um, I put together some math resources. I, we do, we've got some articles about various zero knowledge proof systems, uh, introductions to zero knowledge proofs. We also do online course and online courses for free. If you're interested in those, uh, come and talk to me uh, as well. I can I can show you how to sign up for those. Okay, uh, I'll probably finish there. I'm sorry that I only got part way through. Um, if you want me to yeah, sort of go through the session more uh, online, I'm certainly happy to do that. So contact me and I'll set up a session to do that. Thanks, everyone.